Uh, so I will give the second lecture on the quantum toric geometry. Uh, in the direction of modular spaces, there is many directions for this object, the quantum integral system, and all the fields, the logarithmic transforms. Uh, we have a, a lot of fronts open in this subject of quantum toric geometry, as it's to be expected. But today I will insist on the kind of more novel aspect of the field, the modular spaces. You don't have these for classical toric variety. So uh, it's the most novel. All the other things you kind of have, you know, but but uh, but this one is the most novel aspect of the theory. Uh, for the classical toric varieties, equivariantly they are rigid. You cannot move, and that's why they 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 are arithmetic. You know, they have this rational fan. A rational fan cannot be moved, but a fan that doesn't need to be rational can be moved. And now you have a modular space. Uh, but naively, this modular space is a real manifold or orbital or something like that. But it's real. Remove the fan, you get the field. You have these real coordinates, you know, for the rays. What is perhaps surprising about this story is that the modular space, even extremely mild conditions, becomes a complex solid, and this was a surprise even for me. It becomes naturally a complex solid, and this is just so. Uh, we can prove it. Uh, it has this natural complex structure, uh, but it's still a bit mysterious to me why the gods would want such a thing to happen. Uh, because it's for us, it's I don't, all this theory is very natural, and there is one trick. Um, that's the problem. It has one trick, and we haven't been able to get rid of, uh, to give a conceptual explanation of the trick. Uh, so that's more with the, the, the situation. Are we recording? Yeah, we're yes. Okay. Very well. I'd like to ask you one question. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, you know, toric variety has a large automorphism group, not just finite group, but still. But you have the torus, for example. Yeah, yeah, so then does still have just obifo, right, as a modularized state? Or are you somewhat rigidified? Well, the thing is that the toric variety as an equivariant space doesn't have a large automorphism group. Uh, it hasn't, this is a confusion. You could think of it as a complex manifold, or even as a Kähler manifold. Oh, but no, we're not seeing it like that. We're seeing it as something that is toric, it lives over the toric side. You already, you know, you already uh, consider that symmetry in total the space itself. It remember that it has it. Remember that it has it. And then, then it totally rigidifies. So it's, you need some rigidification anyway. Huh? You need some rigidification to make it obifold, for modernized space to be obifold. No, you will need that the dimension is even different. Because you could have the whole dimension of thing, and then, then it's not complex. <laughs> Literally, we need that dimension of it. It's a little, an, 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 an combinatorial minimum technical condition, right? of combinatorial discrete nature, not a religious agency. So, uh, so no, you know, very quickly, but anyway, uh, uh, we remember that we had uh, uh, we remember that we had the uh, uh, how I'll go uh, like this is easier. Uh, so uh, we remember that we had the non commuted torus. The non commuted torus. Uh, uh, was an algebra as a non-commutative space, but it had a geometric uh, avatar that was the the holonomy groupoid, the holonomy groupoid of the Kronecker foliation. Uh, this holonomy groupoid uh, is uh, the Kronecker, imagine the Kronecker foliation in your mind. 
And now uh, the holonomic group oil of the chronicle position is equivalent as a group oil to the transversal group oil of the rotation. And it's, it has the dichotomy, rational and irrational. When it's irrational, then the portion will be no color. When it's rational, the portion will be just, uh, because the lead would be just because not, the portion would be a circle in this case. And uh, thanks so much. Thanks so much. And uh, uh, but the thing that we then think of the stack, so, uh, so the whole thing is that uh, we think of these things as stacks. So we, because we think that, uh, for example, uh, these foliations will have holonomic groupoids, this, the convolution algebra construction will give a non commutative algebra, the groupoid equivalence class under Morita equivalence will give a stack. But uh, but uh, but we uh, not uh, uh, we want stacks over the toric side, not just the stacks over the manifolds, and then uh, non commutative spaces. Uh, well, <coughs> uh, all the convolution algebra is invariant under the Morita equivalence, and then you get the non commutative space. So the non commutative torus had these avatars, and this is the basic thing that we are going to compactify to get the non commutative uh, uh, quantum varieties or the, to, to, uh, the quantum toric varieties. Uh, the important part is in this basic example, the holonomy, uh, the, the rotation group of the transversal circle is here, and h bar is the holonomy, and it could be rational or irrational. And uh, and that's a quantum torus as a stack, and it produces the usual algebra of the quantum torus by the convolution uh, construction for group points. Give me a sister algebra, non commutative sister algebra. It's likely so non commutative, it's not horribly non commutative. But if, if I take the Lie algebra or the universal cover of S1, then I can see this as just a linear space modulo a, la a lattice, but it's not quite a lattice, it's some con thing that people call a quasi-lattice, is gamma in our notation, is something that people call a quasi-lattice, and that I call a quantum lattice. Uh, so it, 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 it comes typically from crystallography and that kind of things, uh, uh, and I will call it a quantum lattice, because it's natural for me, in that other field is called a quasi lattice. But think that it's like it's like, it's like generalization of the notion of lattice. And think that H bar is irrational for me. So uh, uh, there you then you can compactify this quantum tori and get quantum toric varieties. You can compactify this quantum tori and get quantum toric varieties. So that's that. Uh, but there is a very important uh, construction for us, that is that of, of the uh, LBM manifolds associated to the uh, quantum toric. Uh, so if I have a, toric, a classical toric variety here, just a classical toric variety, let me think it's scalar. Uh, well, uh, and then imagine that it is P1. Then, then it is manifold and that is compact, that is complex manifold, that is non scalar, non symplectic, that uh, has the homotopy type of the twofold homotopy cover of uh, plus. Cross something or plus things. So, in the example, what this is is the Hopf vibration. We want to make it complex, the Hopf vibration. So, you multiply by S1 and you get a Hopf surface. And this is the Hopf vibration for P1. And here you have an elliptic vibration. The fibers are elliptic curves, famously. 
So famously, this is all these things. It's compact, complex, not symplectic. And, uh, and essentially, you kill the second homotopic, and then you complexify, you know? The complexified second uh, You kill the second homotopic, the optic, of two-fold homotopic over complexified two-fold homotopic over. So this is, this is what it looks like. But then I can, I may want to think of it uh, not as an elliptic vibration, but as a, a as a, I further think that C uh, winds around uh, this E as the universal cover. But of course, uh, I could just uh, uh, use some exponential math to get it like that. And uh, let me just call it X carelessly. Uh, and so I may want to think that these are C leaves of a foliation, C leaves, not E leaves of a foliation, but leaves that are C but are wound up. As a physicist to say, you know, the brain winds on itself. Uh, so if I see it like this, and not like this, then I can deform it holomorphically. If I see it like this, I can't. If I see it like this, so I can move the leaves and make, just like in the non commutative torus, if I have a rational Kronecker foliation, was a torus not? But if I think that it's R that is winding rationally, R, now I can deform R a little bit and produce one of these foliations with every leaf is dense. Typically of the situation where it's a truly non commutative space. Likewise, here I have this. But what is very beautiful is that if I take zero and infinity out of this story, I get this story. It's exactly a linear, it's exactly a linear Kronecker foliation if I take zero and infinity. I just get the Kronecker foliation. So this elliptic vibration can be interpreted as the Complexification, compactification of a torus knot. The complexification and compactification of a torus knot. Uh, why this? Well, because if I take zero and infinity and take the real part, it looks like this. This part of what we prove. Uh, so if I it's linear, so if I complexify, well, you know, get this complexify on a complex. Uh, well, of course, this is C star. Uh, and uh, this thing of the two and one dimensional issue I explained. This is what is going on here is one more step. You have to take the transversal to the torus. Okay. And this will be the transversal cell to T1. So it will be the rotation group. Uh, anyway, uh, you can go from this thing and do operations and compactify and get this story. And this issue of the dimensions I went through last time, that it seems to be all of one dimension. And it's about the transversal and equivalence of the group of. So, uh, so this elliptic vibration can be construed uh, stacky wise in your mind as the complexification and compactification of this story. But you have to use stacks, you see, because indeed it's confusing. If you do this, you have to first cut the transversal circle, use that groupoid, and that's the one that lives in here. So there is this Morita equivalence that makes the geometric picture slightly more elaborate. But if you trust me, this is what is going on. And in general, if you have a, a, a more general toy have this picture in mind, but I'm going to erase it. If you have a more general toric manifold, then what you have maybe it's moment map. Uh, and, uh, and now here you have something. Uh, well, not quite an elliptic vibration, but uh, you have higher dimensional tori. Uh, in, in this construction here, you have higher dimensional torus, billion varieties. So you have, let me call it E, something that 
is not unlike an elliptic curve, but it's of higher dimension. And so you have this, this vibration. This is scalar. This is holomorphic. And you can uh, imagine that this is a holomorphic foliation. And again, but the thing is that here you have a certain dimensional uh, cover that is just C to the L, just C to the L. That's a cover. So they're complex story, they have complex stories, they are given the right. Do they have polarization really? Yeah. Well, let me just call the complex story. It's, oh, it, okay. it gets, okay. sometimes, uh, it, it, it gets a lot, of, you know, you get a lot of bells and whistles if I say the whole story. But what is totally true is that there will be a complex story. And then uh, you have C to the L, and then and then you can think of the same. You think of it as this sort of holomorphic. You won't be able to deform it. But uh, and this amounts to a uh, problem is when you do it like this, this winds on itself. So here X acquires a germ degree of freedom because it has a stabilizer now at every point. It has a stabilizer. You did it like this. In the world of stats. In the world of stats, if you do it like this, then it's not where x is the calibrated version of x. Well, what is the band of this curve? Uh, for CP1, it's, it's an integer cost uh, integer many times. Um, uh, for CP1, uh, it's just a z band. And uh, in the more general case, uh, well, uh, I said, I ah, hear this. In the more general case, uh, it's a z to the a, where a is n minus the rank of the quasi lattice. Uh, so this is uh, this is the germ that appears here. So you have here you have digitalization of the hop surface. In fact, it's very well known for pro uh, products of projective spaces. For part of projective spaces, this is the, the Calabi Ekman vibration. There's a product of spheres topologically. There's topologically is a product of spheres. It's the Calabi Ekman vibration. If it is a product, but this Calabi Ekman vibration can be further generalized to any toric variety. And what appears here, this generalization was achieved by, uh, at various stages and sets. Of uh, by Lopez de Medrano. Berkowski. And Nelson. So the LBM. So, and then there is an even more elaborate version that is called the LBMB that allows you to avoid k -learns. So there is an even more Elaborated, slightly more combinatorial, with more bells and whistles, Bosio. And when you have the whole package of LBMB, then you can avoid, avoid killerness and put any toy variety here. Already. Uh, so, uh, it's all over the complex field. It's all over the complex field. So you have this, you have this M. Uh, and this, you have these foliations of N, uh, but if you see them as foliations, you, you lose the germ. And if you see them as group actions, you remember the germ. It's the calibrated and the uncalibrated version. And it's much better to have the calibrated version. Uh, and I'll explain uh, what this happens. But remember, there is an A here. There's so much germ going on. If you see it as a group action rather than as a foliation. Traditionally, in these papers, they saw it as a foliation, but soon in this theory, it seems obvious that there is a be it's much better to see it as a group action for our purpose. To ask the germ, to remember the germ. Because uh, when you have the irrational situation, you have this non-commutative space, 
no, no, no problem. Ironically, when it's rational, it, everything is off. But if you add the jerk, now you have a nice modular space. Because you add this non commutative degrees of freedom to the non mutative manifold. Now, so you calibrate it with the jerk. Now, the thing is, uh, this is this is perfectly analogous. If uh, Siroja was here, we we'll go to turning on the field, to restoring the electromagnetic duality. So you, you have electromagnetic duality, and then you break the, you destroy the electromagnetic duality. So there is no more in the space. If you restore the electromagnetic duality, you just put the gerb on it when it's rational, when the thing is rational, then you restore the electromagnetic duality, and now you get a beautiful and now modular space. It's a manifold, well, almost a manifold. And, and, and everything is fine and nice. So this is a, this is a protox. Another, uh, Lopez and Medrano came from a different angle that is very beautiful, and it's very deeply related to this. This is really uh, the, the outcome of thinking of intersection of real quadrics, or intersection of real quadrics on complex periphery space. This is the intersection of real quadrics. So, uh, if you study inter the, the, all real quadrics, intersection of real quadrics appear here uh, at these objects. So there is a correspondence of. So this construction, um, do you start with X, a classical Fourier variety, mm -hmm. construct the jerk, and then. Do Not the historically. Quadrics. Historically, you start with an intersection of quadrics, you go in, then because of dynamical systems, you got the foliation. When it comes with a natural flow, and when you look at the quotient of ah, wow, it's a historic variety, and all of them appear like that. So historically, it's a very different path. But you can put it on its head and start with historic variety. And everything comes from there. You see what I mean? So there's one more avatar here that is important, but I will not stress today, that is intersection of quadrics. One more avatar here. But just let me stay with this picture. And this picture allows you to construct the motion space and to show that it's a complex orifold uh, and to do geometric invariant theory. Thing is, the natural coordinates for n, for the for n, the natural coordinates for n, and for the dynamical system, you have to think of it really as a dynamical system. As, as I said, the dynamical system remembers the jerk, the pollution doesn't. So if you think of it as a dynamical system and as a modular space of dynamical systems, then uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say, but it's dynamical <laughs> system. Uh, so, uh, and the dynamical system does remember the jerk. So, uh, these are examples. Uh, Ah, yeah, I remember. The co natural coordinates for the dynamical system. Uh, this is where I, I, I stopped last time. I more said this, but I didn't say it. So I said it again. Now, the natural coordinates for the dynamical system, uh, we call lambda. And the natural coordinates for the toy variety, well, are the things with the fault of the fan, or the, all this story. And lambda and D. The natural parameters here, what obscures this relationship a little bit, is, is that they are uh, corresponded by Gale transform. So uh, I'm going into that. And we call, uh, and this allows to produce quantum geometric invariant theory. This allows you to produce quantum geometric invariant theory. Remember, also, the following. I said it last time, uh, when we deform this situation and no, we no longer have, can afford E, but we definitely have C to the L in the truly non commutative situation, in the truly non commutative situation, this is the truly non commutative situation, in this situation, uh, uh, H bar is my deformation parameter for this uh, 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 for this story, you know. Now this could become non-commutative. 
as the foliation becomes more and more dense everywhere, as the elliptic vibration becomes not an elliptic vibration, but a foliation that becomes dense everywhere, the quotient becomes a non commutative toric variety. It still has around the map, by the way. But now the polytope becomes irrational. Uh, if you want the Kähler case, just think of the Kähler case. The polytope becomes irrational and never changes throughout the modular space. If I fix the commutator, then we want to glue these modular spaces. If I fix the commutator, it never changes. What changes is the way the, the foliation is occurring, the dynamical system. What moves is the dynamical system. As I move it holomorphically, as I move holomorphically the dynamical system, I end up with this. And now the gerb in the non, in the truly non commutative case, the gerb is absorbed into the non commutativity. It's only in the rational case that I need the gerb. Uh, so forget the gerb, now it's absorbed into the non commutativity of the space. This non commutative degree of freedom, because this always could, didn't have an option. Had, to have electromagnetic duality, never has an option. The polytope becomes irrational. This is can be thought of as the what is the parameter of the formation for the formation quantization in this theory? Well, I told you now uh, the, your your typical fan. Think of the case of P two, and this is AB. Your typical fan. Uh, I want to do this fix. I want to move this ray, but now you have this. Quasi lattice, gamma. But gamma, you're remembering gamma is you're remembering the foliation. And, and the image of the holonomy of the foliation in the transversal. This is the, the fan lives in the universal cover of the transversal to the foliation. That's where the fan lives. In the in, in the algebra, in the universal cover, this, this story is happening. Here, this is this. In the, so it looks like you have one dimension off. So it's happening here. In the, in the, you have these foliations, you know, you have these codes of the foliation. You have, you're compact. You can always recover the whole thing by a torus construct, by a suspension construction. So when I get this thing, uh, I can always recover the, this foliation. Is, uh, I can always do the, the suspension of this foliation, the suspension construction of this foliation to answer your question. And it will have inside the chronicle foliations and compactify them. This will have inside the chronicle foliation and compactify them. And, and of course, there is many higher dimension chronicle foliations and all this story. Very well. So uh, that's how it looks. But, but H bar was. But if I want to remember the gem in the rational case, I take the beautiful square lattice, but in much bigger dimension. If this is B, this is a much larger dimension than I map here. For example, in the classical case of one and H bar, that you get the bile algebra for the quantum classical quantum system, this has to be the square lattice in R2. One goes to one. One thing goes to one, and the other thing goes to H bar. And they are algebraically independent. So that's the situation. That's the situation. And everything can be, it has to be uh, spoken in the language of the topos of toric varieties. I explain why the language of the topos is expressive enough. So we have the language of the topos of toric varieties of added of O minimally of the Rx, R annex language. So if you add this language, in, that is an O-minimal structure to the language of the topos of toric varieties, all these can be said perfectly fine. And then you say it. Uh -huh. So, um, OK, so the deformation you're saying goes on upstairs in a way. Do you recover the, the gamma, I guess? From you deform H bar. This is the deformation parameter. This map, this map. This is the deformation parameter. Because upstairs you're telling us that you're sort of that you're thinking about this sort of. I have this beautiful score like this. 
tilted, I'm going to to this mess. The rational mess, and I can move this and move the environment. So is this the reason why you want to go upstairs to see this uh, deformation kind of in a nice way, so to speak? Because otherwise, you know, if I think in terms of like deforming lattices or something like that, uh, or, you know, making the, starting with the rational, the real lattice and then deforming it, uh, you would probably try to do it downstairs in a way. So, but you were saying if you go upstairs, this is kind of a deformation or foliation of a. Uh, it will give you the deformation of the condition as you move the linear map h bar. Just the linear map h bar. So it's a linearization. You're having these horrendous equations and you're linearizing it. And is the h bar the d field? Or is it the same thing or not? The h bar is. I mean, no. It's not a, in physics. This picture. The h bar includes the v field. The h bar includes the v field. Includes the jet, the information of the jet. Each bar includes the field information of the jet. But then it's that H bar, H bar. And, uh, and you would like to get the classical information for the combinatorics of the polytons and all that story, and that's the gauge transform. You do the classical gauge transform. In the theory of complex polytopes, and uh, this will allow you to go from the gamma parameters to the A parameters. Now you know the phases of this polytope and everything, you know, and it's the gate and so on. So this gate duality, uh, this gate duality is very important for us, and it will allow us to do the, the, exactly the geometric invariant theory. Let me explain. Uh, so, uh, if uh, I have the calibrated situation with the gerb in the rational case, and I get, well, I get this uh, uh, typical definition of what to take off CN, typical definition of what to take off uh, CN, if I have the quantum fan. Have the quantum fan, and uh, and could we move this? I think maybe I should do this. Isn't it? Should I? Uh, I hope I can move it all the way here. And uh, and now I define explicitly uh, this action. But you know, now it's, I have the. I have this thing, you know, the story varieties are working here in this dynamical system. So I add, uh, and well, the action preserves the set and commutes with the action of the torus. Uh, and so uh, we do know that A, this action, this action here, and I consider this stack as modulo. This action, so we consider that the stack is given by the information of the H but via gate transform. Via gate transform. So via the gate transform, I construct this action on this uh, thing that I took off the, the this is the stable and semi stable locus of our situation. I define the action by gate transform, and I consider the stack as model. Okay. And now, uh oh. And, yeah, I recover the, I recover this. Why is this a theorem and not a definition? It could be a definition. Because I defined this by charts in the previous talk. So if I define this by charts, I can, I, I'll explain very briefly how do you define it by charts. Then this is a theorem. Otherwise, this could be the definition of the quantum theory variety, and the chart would be the theorem that you can define it by charts. You have this atlas by charts. 
So uh, just remind you very quickly how you would do it by charts. Uh, this is an example. Uh, a it has nothing to do with the previous A. I'm sorry for the problem. It's just names for the matrices that take this code. This is P2. You let me make sure, make sure that I'm okay. Again, I'm okay. And straighten the cones. These are just the matrices by straighten these three cones. So you straighten the cones, and now you have these. Uh, if you take zero out of C2, this is a quantum torus. It's a quantum torus by a quasi lattice. This is a quantum torus that is a representation of the linear space divided by the quasi lattice, quantum lattice. But I can close it up on one side and I can glue them by this mapping. Now, in this language that this topos produces, this Z to the irrational numbers makes sense. In the language of this topos, these maps that make sense. Geometrically, they make sense because you're taking the logarithm, the linear displacements in the logarithm chart, and then exponential. That's why I need this local analytic and, expo and exponential map, and the global exponential map. So we do that. And, uh, and we get the deformations of P2 into quantum P2. So we define it by charts. This is the geometric invariant theory that uh, explains how to obtain it uh, take, by taking off, by considering only the semi-stable locus. What the kind of stacks are these? These are stacks uh, over the side. These are stacks. I, I gave the precise definition. But the side, I define a side of, of toric uh, varieties, and the side of uh, the side of complex manifolds with the action of an abelian group, and this is the interaction of these two sides that define these stacks. Okay. So, given these two sides, you define these stacks, and. Uh, uh, they are non-separated. In the classical sense over manifolds, they are highly non-separated stacks. In any case, uh, well, uh, I, I can do it with the foliation. If I forget the action, and I just take the foliation, is what I was saying. Forget the action, you just take the foliation. Uh, the estacification of the holonomy group poly of the foliation is the, forget the gem. Exactly forget the gem. So the estacification of the holonomy group of the foliation exactly forgets the germ. So it's what I said. Okay. Uh, so you have the calibrated and the uncalibrated case. You have the calibrated. This is as a dynamical signal, as a group action of an abelian group on a complex manifold, non-compact abelian group on a complex manifold. Uh, or you see it as a foliation and then you remember the gel, or you forget the gel, and this generalizes the Calabi Eggman vibrations. Uh, they are holomorphic, and they are the they natural organization of elliptic vibrations and abelian vibrations and Calabi Eggman vibrations. So uh, we have this, and this is, this is supported by the quantum geometric invariant theory that we just considered. And essentially, the, the input, the source of this quantum geometric invariant here is a gate transform. It's a gate transform. Okay. So that's that. Uh, so uh, we have the foliation and the calibrated, uh, the calibrated and uncalibrated uh, uh, LBM. And I call this because LBM. People always call them manifolds, but it, it came with a canonical foliation. And I'm moving the foliation into other foliations by moving the parameters. I call this quantum LBM. Uh, I'm deforming the LBM theory with a nice bar parameter. I call it quantum LBM to distinguish it from the classical LBM theory. So the formation of the classical theory. OK. Uh, and now it's one can use the results of hierarchy, Shida, almost verbatim. One has to do a bit of translation of language, but not of content. Uh, and he's told 
torus invariant of their case affiliations. And so quantum torics uh, with delta complete scale, if and only if delta is positive. Delta is a quantum, not the quantum, but the quantum. So uh, it could be an irrational polyp. could be an irrational polyp. So quantum torus with delta complete is scalar if and only if delta is polypole, as you would expect. As you would expect. Nice. Nice story. So we can do we we can characterize scalarness from the fan. And here I go, finally. Uh, uh, I fix the combinatorial type. Then, I, then I'm not going to finish. Let me go into that first informally and then with the slides. Um, but it's already very late, isn't it? Uh, uh, you, started, you started very late. <laughs> well, uh, I will uh, go very fast. Because I'm going to just talk about the main idea. Uh, you see, when you have the modular space, uh, so if it's a combinatorial type, and then I can move, never then I can move the rays, and I can move the fan, you know, in a complicated fashion. Or, if you don't want to move the fan in your imagination, you fix kind of the picture of the fan, and you move the lattice. You move, that is moving the bar. So it's equivalent to be moving the rays, that's what people kind of try with various attempts, than to use flip the picture and move the gamma through moving the edge. So we move the edge bar. Well, but this is, from my perspective, that this is a quantum integral system with, para with quantum, with Planck's constant h bar, it's very natural. I move h bar. So I move h bar, and then I get a modular space, and quantum toric stacks. Uh, so, uh, and this is what it looks like. What is beautiful, of course, is that the rational forms of this modular space are the classical toric parameters. And the irrational forms of this toric uh, modular space are the quantum toric stacks or non commutative or quantum toric varieties. Uh, so uh, you have here all the classical toric varieties that are around. Uh, and then here you have all the weighted predictive spaces. Of course, some of these things have more symmetries than others, but they are really combinatorial symmetries, not these continuous symmetries. Really, if you think of the polytope, are symmetries of the polytope that give you the overflow points. Symmetries of the, of the well, geometric, but the Euclidean geometric symmetries of the, uh, of the polytope or of the fan, and it looks like this. Uh, the roof of points occur whenever the fan suddenly has more symmetries. The classical torque varieties will land on the rational locus of some of these modular spaces. And uh, in a... And of course you start getting all sorts of bells and whistles and flavors of these modular spaces. Uh, but there's some that are more natural than others. Uh, in any case, we have a tight linear space. And if you are wondering what, and someone asked me, uh, is this really the deformation, the, the right distance of deformation? It is. And Laurent, and he's speaking in Merida in January about this issue, he's even a maker, that will be recorded. Uh, the the best of the Kodaira Spencer deformation theory of complex stacks, and the number generator. Uh, and this is exactly the Collider Spencer deformation theory for the stacks. Uh, what I've been saying in this talk. Uh, and then there is this indispensable point. Uh, it's really a combinatorial technical issue. You ignore it. Uh, it's a miracle uh, that when you have the correct evenness, if the Johnson dimension is even, it's a complex object. So it can, and the reason that it has a complex structure is the gate transform. So it's a little bit, uh, right now we don't, I don't understand why it's just so, because you just want to have a complex structure. Uh, 
So, uh, so you mean H by is real, but this space is has no first structure. Uh, H by is real, but this space is real. real, but the definition of space has no first structure. The, the, the problem is that H bar has is a complex parameter. You didn't realize it was a complex parameter. It doesn't look like a complex parameter, but secretly it is. And the complex, the complex, you see to the gate transform. And when you gate transform it there, ah, it's an obvious complex thing. And so it has a complex structure, the space of each bar through the gate transform. So what is the relation between the storage variety, uh, classes of storage varieties that appear at rational points in this numerical space? What is the relation? Huh? Yeah, between the storage classes of storage varieties. For example, all spaces. weighted vertical spaces will be there in the one of P2. All weighted P2. So with different weights. Different weights. All rational, all possible weights. All possible weights. Yeah, but most of them. So of course, they carry the gel, but carry this apparently, apparent paradox. <laughs> carry this gel. The rational one is the P plus the gel that carries the defect to restore the electromagnetic body. Okay. Uh, in any case, is there any conceptual explanation why this type of space appears in this as a numerical space? Well, no, no, uh, no, because you have so many avatars to the stories. The natural type number space for the like, for the dynamic, the, the holomorphic dynamical system. It's not. It's not Everything is extremely concrete. I mean, it's absolutely concrete in the paper. Uh, but I mean, is there any one what to write explanation why this type of space should appear? Uh, I don't know what would qualify as an explanation. Uh, is really. Let me let me just. Uh, I can explain, <laughs> but it gets into a more, uh, uh, a little bit more detail than what to go do right now. Uh, well, let me skip the twist or complexification. Let me, there's a basic one though. There's all these flavors, uh, but take the one in which you have one mark form for the lab, it's for every day, numerical, you would call them numerical coincidences in the level of generality that we can work. Well, let's work with these numerical coincidences. This is even, this thing is the same, this number is the same as this number, so this kind of thing. And so now you get your model, your type number space, uh, you get this uh, uh, you get H, the space of H, this, this. Space of H in your time in space. And uh, well, this is a modular space. It is in the, in the most canonical case, it is just this space of H, but it's very linear thing, divided by the symmetric group of the rays and the automorphism of the poset for the time. The automorphism is just a group. And, uh, and here is the action. And that's this piece of the modulus, this modulus, which I fix this. Just that. That's the modulus space. I mean, the covariance space of the formation theory of this stack. That's it. Natural thing. That's what it is. And in classical MGM, I'm going to finish now. Classical MGM, classical MGM, you have the genus. That is topological or combinatorial. And you have something that makes the space nicer, makes it nicer by marking things, by adding structure, adding a little structure. Mark and map This modular space, our modular space, is going to have MGM. Where G will be B, the combinatorial type of the family, 
and then the gerb number. The mark gerb, I don't know what to call it, the gerb number. How much gerb you put? And you put some gerb to make the space nicer. That's all you do. You put some gerb to make the space nicer. Like, I could take off the gerb and you get a horrible model space. You use this. You put a little bit of gerb into the mix. Then I get a nice modular space, complex of. And this is the previous one. G is D, and N is, well, there, there it is, N, and this is the dimension. So it's M, D, N. And now you, you get all these modular spaces, and you degenerate things, and you glue them, and you get the compactification. Well, let's do that. Uh, so that's an easy one, RPD. So we compute the modular space and the basic modular space. The basic modular space is just RPD, modular symmetric group. The basic modular space. RPD, modular symmetric group. And uh, we have a universal family. We get a universal family to have the right to call it modular space for the quantum bds. And we can compactify. And of course, you start here, you move here, back. And this cone disappears. We have here, we go here. And we go here, and you get this stratification, and then you have the geometric invariant here, you have this gauge, and blah, 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 blah. So this model is just the complex structure. No, no, this is an example in which we just have the, we just worry about the real, we have to ask more gels to get the complex structure. This is just the basic one. Uh, notice that uh, we are just uh, putting the most basic gerb that you can put. But you think this open subset and RPC. Well, remember, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. If this out, it, yeah, exactly. You, we, you need evenness conditions, this kind of thing. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But this is general. This is just real. Just for the topologies. This this slide is for Miguel, because uh, we should study understand uh, very well the topology of this modular space and how they interact in simplicial structure. And uh, uh, and Antoine Boava took our calculation for PD and did it in general. And it has a universal family in it. Because so always the compactification for toric modular space of toric parameters. It's a little bit what my street was asking for at some point. Uh, and that's all. I'm very late. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can you do uh, D Q G I D? Uh, variation of Q G I D. Uh, yeah. Well, I think so, yeah. If you see the paper of Antoine, it allows you to go into that direction. Uh, yeah, I think so, that we have enough. They would have to do with the combinatorial structure of the fan, not with the... Uh, yeah. I would notice that the combinatorial structure of the fan changes right. as I degenerate. Yeah, I must be, yes, mm -hmm. yes. As I degenerate, it changes the combinatorial structure. Changes. So it sounds like you can sort of get out of the usual PGID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A different dimension and yeah. come back. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can do that. We can do that. But that's what the physicist kept saying. Well, we can, we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. He has said this already. BQ. Yeah, it is. Oh, Antoine's paper. Uh, so we can go and 
those dimensions, it's just those two different dimensions, it comes back. I love that. It's a nice way to stay. You know, I was looking how you can use topological construction for creating the PKC or cryptography. Uh, can you see here any one sided function? Something that is easy to do but difficult to develop? I don't, I'm, I'm sorry, we have not. <laughs> I discovered, we, we discovered, but we wrote discover, uh, using this, a quantum computing algorithm that uh, factorizes large integer numbers. This is the subject. How can you not say it? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the subject of my talks in Denmark in a month and I have to have the tape set. <laughs> but we can, we can produce a quantum computing algorithm. It's a beautiful story. It's a long story. Uh, we can factorize this with a quantum computer. With huge numbers is in this story. So yeah, it's a beautiful story. So if you can factorize it, it might not be a PKC, because it means that you break it, so you present the PKC and break it Quantum computer. That's what you do? No, we're more about breaking. But frankly, it was just the pandemic, you know, too much free time. <laughs> yeah, but we can talk about it. Can. Well, thank you very much.